the purpose and the point of the series is, is really simple, and it's this. We hope to discover all that we are in Christ, but not only that, we hope to understand all that we can become in and through Christ. And here's some truth, and, and this is not just true for our students. Um, of course, my background is student ministry, and I saw this so many times through our ads um, that we see from the world. The world certainly has a version of who you should be. And the world has a version of who you should become. It's, got, um, it, it's, it's always in front of you. The commercials that you see, the music that you hear, everything is geared and for advertising. The world is a marketing place. It really is. And it's, and it's beckoning for your attention, and not only your attention, but guess what? Your money, your time, your pursuits, your drive, your passions. So the world has a version. Here's what the world says. The world wants you to know that you are enough. The world wants you to know that you've got it in you. All you've got to do is mine it out, and we want to help you. But you've got it in yourself to do it. It's your life. Just go and live it. It's another ad that they have. But above all, it says this. You are the center of it all. That's what the world wants you to know. It's what the world is telling you. Like, you've got it all. It's all about you, and you've got everything it takes to get what you desperately want. But here's the truth. God has a version, too. It happens to be the original, and it's the ultimate. God's version says this. God's glory is why we do all we do. At the end of the day, it's really simple. God's glory is the why we are to live. Only Christ makes that life possible. That's where you get some friction and some pushback from the world. The world says you've got it in you, um, but God says you don't have it in you. You need help along the way, but God comes along with that and says, and Christ is the answer. You don't have it in you because who you are and what you are is honestly not enough. You need help. Christ is the help. And get this, as we put off sin and as we put on Christ, the how is easy. Can I just take the pressure off of you? It's not me, actually. It's the Word of God. As you put on Christ, then God releases you just to go and live your life, the life that you have now in Christ Jesus. God says, go and live your life, but where should I go? Go where you want to go, as long as you go in the name of Jesus. So we do this, what, where? Well, we do it here at home, Jerusalem. We do it um, in our area, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost. Ultimately, we take the gospel to the nations. Nowhere is off limits to where we are today uh, to go. So today we finish up the who, what, when, where, and how with the when. So when are we to do this? When is this life meant to be lived, supposed to be lived? When would God have us live a life that brings him glory? Don't you just love the when questions? Parents, you get them all the time. I wish we had the curiosity and the question ability uh, or the, the, the asking of questions ability that kids have. If you mention the slightest possibility that you may or may not do something really cool, they won't leave you alone about it. Hey, Daddy, when are we going? When are we going? When are we going to do that? Well, I said we were just thinking about it. Well, when are we going to go? Mama, when are we going to do this? When are we going to leave? We, we haven't even said if we're going yet. I mean, you, the slightest possibility, they will never let you forget the fact that you brought it up. Now, when are we going to go? Um, but some of you, I mean, adults, we're the same way, right? Let's think about it, men. Some of you are going, when's, when's he going to wrap this up already? So, so we, all, we, all, we all do the when stuff, right? Um, but the answer for the when we are to proclaim Christ and point to Christ is really rather simple. Like, you don't have to dig too far to see this. And it's been uh, seen and said many times in Scripture, but today we go back to Philippians. Paul, let me just give you a little context, and then we're going we're gonna to stand and read. But Paul writes the Philippian church to encourage them, but he's also writing to challenge them. Get this, they're in the midst of a suffering that we simply don't know about. We have a little bit of a clue about, because as you go and you live your life for Christ, you're going to get opposition in this world, aren't you? If you go and speak the name of Jesus, especially today, now you could, you could maybe get by just living a life of good morality, and people may pat, pat you on the back, but as soon as a life of good works is partnered with the name of Jesus Christ, for some reason, we begin to get pushed back. You get skipped over for the promotion. You don't get asked to the parties anymore. 
but that's not a bad thing. You don't get asked to the events anymore. That friend maybe stops calling you a little bit less. We, we understand suffering, but we don't understand this sort of suffering. So Paul is writing to challenge them, to bring them a little bit of comfort. And he does so by pointing to his own life. I want you to look at your scripture real quick before we read the, the focal point. But look at Philippians 1.21. This is a signature verse for Philippians and for the life of Paul. But I want you to notice in, in my translation, the first three words says this, for to me. So in Philippians 1.21, Paul is using himself as an example. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he's he's challenging them, he's bringing them comfort, and he's using himself as an example. To me, here's where I stand, Paul is saying, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He ultimately points to the example of Jesus in Philippians 2, right? So at the very end of the sandwich, at the bottom piece of bread, he, he points to Jesus as the example. In life and in death, Jesus lived for the glory of God. That's what it says in 2.11. 2.11, at the end of this Jesus portion and pointing to Jesus as the ultimate example he says that at every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for what purpose why did Jesus live his life to the glory of God the Father so sandwiched in between that first example of himself and the last example of Christ is this challenge to the Philippian church right Paul turns the focus to them and what we find is the answer to when we are to live a life for God's glory and, and again, it's very simple. Why do we always think of Scripture as being some equation we've got to figure out? Like the Bible is some riddle, we really got to think hard to get to what it means. No, here's what God has done. Here's God's greatest, almost one of the greatest gifts of grace that he's given to us. He makes the main things of Scripture the plain things of Scripture. Almost everybody in this room could quote John 3.16. I mean, a beautiful passage. It's one of the main focus points of all of Scripture, and it's one of the plainest things to grasp. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a main thing. That's a main thread of Scripture, and it's a plain thing. Everybody, non-believers alike, know that passage. So God makes the main things the plain things. He's not expecting us to have seminary degrees to understand the truths of Scripture. So what is the ultimate answer to the when question? Well, here's our main idea for this morning, and then we'll stand and read. Our main idea is this, and it's very simple. Our entire life is meant to be spent for the gospel of Christ and the glory of God. That's a a sermon in a sentence. Our entire life is meant to be spent for the gospel of Christ and the glory of God. No matter what you do, it's to be done for the gospel and for the glory of God. So with that in mind, that's where we're going. Would you mind standing uh, with me in honor and reverence of of the reading of God's word, if you're able, as we read Philippians 1, 27 and 28, two, two verses that are sandwiched in between Paul's example of himself and Paul's example of Christ and the win uh, of life. So Philippians 1, 27 says this, only let your manner of life Your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And get this, not frightened in anything by your opponents, because get this, this is the cool part. This is a clear, they're, 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 I guess, frightening or opposing them. That's a clear sign of their destruction but it's also a clear sign of your salvation and that being from God. And this is the word of the Lord. And God, this morning we praise you for your word. You've not expected us to to wander around on this earth attempting to figure out why we're here and what this life is all about, but you've written to us in your word plainly, Father, what this life is all about and who this life is all about and why this life should be lived. And this morning, as we finish our time thinking about all that we are in Christ, would you cause this word to find um, roots in our heart, in our lives, so as we live, um, as we leave, that we leave going this morning um, with a passion, with a desire, 
to live a life that brings you glory. And Father, use your word. Spirit, you teach this morning um, above all things. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for doing that. Um, so again, our entire life is to be spent for the gospel of Christ and the glory of God. Paul's statement there in, in chapter 1, 21, is saying this, my life is meant to be lived. That, that's, that's almost you, Dad, saying, look, I don't know what y'all are going to do. I'm going to do this. You know, like today, fathers actually get to pick the place to go and eat maybe, right? Um, it's, uh, oh, some of you are going, they always pick. They just make us think we pick, but really, they pick. Uh, but if it is you going, y'all can do what you want to do, but here's what I'm going to do. This is what Paul's saying. He's saying, look, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in this direction, but here, here's where I stand. For to me, li to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I die, it's even better. But if I'm living, I'm living for Christ. But if I die, I'm with Christ. I mean, I'm a winner either way, if I go or if I stay. Um, this world has nothing that can compete with that. So that's why Paul would later say that everything that he'd ever gained in this life, he, he considered it to be rubbish or poop. I mean, like, that's, that's, how I, that's how I viewed everything that I had in this life. It was dung. It's rubbish. It's garbage compared. compared he, didn't say, he didn't say it was bad. He didn't say sports was bad or education was bad or my job, providing for my family or promotions. He didn't say those things were bad, a nice house, a nice car, vacations. He didn't say those were bad. He did say they were bad compared to knowing Christ. If I've got to put one of those two and I've got to pick, I'm always going with Christ. I would always consider those to be dung. If I live, I live Christ. If I die, I'm with Christ. But in verse 27, Paul points to the Philippians and he says, even this should be your life. I'm praying this same life and mindset is going to dwell in you. So we've got one major point today, and it's pretty much the main idea, but it's this. Number one, we're to always be pursuing a life that glorifies God. Always. Let your manner of life be worthy. Um, your translation may say, behave as citizens. Like, no matter where you go, you're a citizen, number one, of the kingdom of God. So as you live here in Philippi, live worthy of the gospel. He's saying this to say, everything that you do, every part of your life is not simply your life. Let your manner of life be lived for uh, the glory of God. But isn't every part of your life your life? I mean, logically speaking, every part of your life, the secret you, the part that you think nobody else knows about, good or bad, that you belongs to God. The Facebook you, <laughs> right, belongs to God. The work you, the school you, the home you, the church you, we all have different versions that we like to communicate to the world. If you go to your, your guys club, guys, you, 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 you live and you act a certain way and you talk big and bad, and <laughs> is that really you? Or is there some kind of facade up? Ladies, you do the same thing when you go to your ladies clubs, I guess, and wherever that is, maybe that's Facebook, a men's and ladies clubs alike, it's all on Facebook. There's this facade, there's this image that we want the world to know about you ever been talking uh, about your yeah, guys i've been in this situation maybe i'm, I'm gonna get off tangent and i'm gonna get myself in trouble but maybe you're talking and guys here here's our mo we're over here with our guys and we're talking about how we run our house and we do this stuff and i mean by golly i'm gonna do what i want to do and your wife comes up taps you on your shoulder hey baby what do you want to you know and she catches you in the act of saying how big and bad you are right we, we've got that you and this you and that you and that you and this you. But what Paul is saying is, lo, all the you's need to match. You're authentic. And you, you, you're who you, you are in Christ. You're always to be pursuing a life. All of you is meant to be spent for the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's what we do know. There's tons of threats to that. There's many things that compete for that. That they're wanting you to be a different version of who God wants you to be. And they make it look so good. They make it look so desirable. If you get this, then you'll get this. And you really want that. And God has said, I can give you that in the best possible way. 
But the world says, I can get it, give it to you quicker and cheaper. And here's what we do. We accept the world's cheap imitation of what only God can give us. So many times, young and old, we accept the lie versus the truth. So the text reminds us that nothing should derail us from a life that always is glorifying God. So I want us to, to look quickly at three possible threats that are mentioned here, but also that are addressed here this morning. Number one is this, and you may not like this too much. I, I didn't as I was studying this out, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't, this kind of hurts a little bit, and they're not going to like this too much. There's no off switch in following Christ. Manner of life means every part of you. You're citizens. You're always a citizen. And we shouldn't view this life with God in the same way, guys, girls, that you view schoolwork or school. Like, when's summer going to get here? There's no summer life with the Christian life. You're always meant to walk in a way that glorifies God. We look for the weekend. We look for that vacation week. I just can't wait to get off. And I'm not saying anything bad about vacations or summers, mind you. I'm just saying we bring that mentality to the Christian walk. When can I just be me? Well, Paul would look at us and like say, what do you mean you? Like, do you really want what you bring to the table? When, when we take on Christ and he fills us, you're his, man. Always, forever. Like the old Randy Travis song, forever and ever, amen. I mean, this is who you now are. You don't take that off. Like, you don't, you don't bring anything to that. You didn't do anything for your salvation. What makes you think you're now going to take it off? There's no off switch. There's no looking for the weekend. As Jesus told some people in Luke chapter 9, he said the cost and the call of following him required everything all of the time. And it was, it was one of the, the famous passages Jesus had, Luke 9, 23. Um, if anyone desires to follow me, let him take up his cross and, and follow me and deny himself, right? Take up cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And then some guys had some excuses. They're like, well, hold on. I need to go do this. And Jesus is like, well, I mean, no. I need to go bury my, my dad. And, and we get sensitive there, and they go, well, I mean, for heaven's sake, Jesus, his dad just died. That's not what the passage is saying. The man was saying, my dad's going to die one day, and I kind of need to be there to not only bury him, but to get all in his inheritance. Everything that's coming to me, I need to be there to get those things. And Jesus is saying, let the dead bury the dead. Like, you need to follow me now. That's what he's calling. We're like, man, can we just relieve that a little bit? Release some of that stress? And if you've been here on a couple of Sunday nights and we talk about there's a line, there's that which God has said, and so many times in our life it doesn't match up with our framework, our view of who God is, and we like to kind of add to that a little bit, legalism, and we like to take away from that a little bit, liberalism. We like to, I don't know if Jesus really meant what he meant. Can I just tell you, Jesus meant exactly what he meant. God means exactly what he means. Let's get to the heart of what God is saying, not put it into in, you know, feel-good terms. That's what's wrong with a lot of people. That's what's wrong in my life so many times. And that's hard. That's a hard saying. How can I make that easier so more people would follow? Well, even Jesus said the road that leads to him uh, is a narrow road road not many people are wanting to go down this road because there's no off switch in following christ but the second threat and the, the second way that he addresses it uh, number two there's no situation that deters us from following christ only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of christ verse 27 so whether i come and see you or i'm absent that i can hear that you're get this standing firm in one spirit with one mind and striving side by side. Now, those are two words, phrases, standing firm and striving side by side, and then eventually you get this suffering word, and that doesn't sound like the perfect weekend, does it? What are you going to do this weekend? Man, I get to build a fence with my family. We got to dig holes in the hot August Carrollton sun, red clay, no auger, us and a shovel, and post hole diggers, and we're going to dig holes all weekend. No, no, we're not. <laughs> we're, that doesn't sound like fun. Your kids would hate you. Your wife would be like, what kind of weekend is this? That's not what we want. I and mean, that's not even the half of what Paul is saying. Standing firm, that denotes a battle to me. Striving, that means it's going to be tough. 
That's what Paul's telling them that life is going to look like. That's what a manner worthy of the gospel looks like. You're fighting for it. You're standing firm. Like you're having to exert some energy in this. Like this is not a cozy weekend. Paul says this is going to be tough. But, but here's the deal. The thought of Christ followers having an easy life is nowhere to be found in Scripture. That's a man-made. That's an us thing. That's a 20th century life, 21st century. That's us wanting more people to follow Christ, and we make it easy to follow him. But we've got to be honest with people. That's what people want. They want honesty. Just shoot, shoot it to me straight. They don't want the used car salesman pitch, right? I know you got a number. Just tell me the number. Don't make me sit. Let's, let's save us a, a bunch of time here. Just tell me what you want for the car, right? That's what people want with, with the gospel. Just be honest with me. But it's going to demand your life. It's going to take everything that you've got. People are going to leave you. This world is not the thing that determines your joy or if life is a success. That's not meant on your promotions, how many games you win, how smart you are, how many friends you have, all the places you get to go. That's good. That's fine. That's not what determines if life is a success. The gospel is going to be tough for people to swallow in your life when it's lived out. Joy is found in Jesus. Not in circumstances, not in situations. Don't avoid the suffering. Embrace it. And never let this world be the one or the thing that defines your joy. So there's no situation. Uh, Miss Anita is going through some, some tough things for the last two years. I'm still learning the situation. If you're a guest this morning, I've been here about four weeks, so I'm still learning people. So um, I've said this a couple of times, but if you're a member and you've been a member, um, and I come up to you and I'm like, so what's your connection? What brings you to Tyus today? Don't get upset and say, well, I've been a member here for 45 years. I'm still getting to know people and stuff. But I do know we have some guests here this morning. Miss Anita is, is one of our faithful members, and they usually sit right there on the second, third row. Um, and she's been struggling with, with cancer. Um, and she got some scans back this past week. Um, and, you know, she, she shared with me on a Monday or Tuesday, but she was wanting to be able to tell all of her family before she told her church family because she didn't want them to find out, of course, you know, through other people. Um, so I think it was Thursday, Friday, she finally texted back. She's like, all right, I've told my family you can let the church know. And so I sent it out to Sean, and he emailed all of the church membership just to let us know about uh, Miss Anita's scans not coming back too great. But her hope and her confidence is not in the scan. Did she want it to be perfectly fine? Of course, who wouldn't? But that answer did not determine if her joy was still going to be there. Why? Because her joy is in Christ. That's the life that Paul is pointing us to. And, and I told her, and then and she was planning on being here in light of that, but then uh, one night she had texted me at 1245, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't get the text of the next day that she had gone to the emergency room. And so she now has pneumonia uh, on, on top of that and is at home. And I'm like, well, that really saddens me because at the end of the service, I was going to bring you down and I was just going to get some men of the church to come and we were just going to pray for you just in this season of your life. And I thought that's what church fellowship truly is, is us joining and linking arms, striving side by side, standing firm, and we wanted you to know that we're in this with you, Anita. And I'm thankful for Anita and many of you. We had some other hospitalizations this past week, um, but it's a joy to see you, church, and to get to know your stories, and there's so many stories on different pews. As I'm hearing about you and the history of this church and your life and things that you've gone through, it's evident that you are not allowing the things of this world to determine your joy. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is what determines your joy. That's what we need in this community, in this culture. People sold out for Christ, living their life for his honor and for his glory. Nothing will deter you from that. But thirdly, and lastly, is this. There's no fear in following Christ. So there's no off switch in following Christ. There's no situation that deters us from following Christ. And there's no fear in following Christ. He goes on to say, and don't be frightened, verse 28, in anything by your opponents. Like, we're not to be frightened. Why are we not to be frightened? Because God's got this. He's got it. We're in his hand. We were talking about baptism at the Wednesday night Bible study for the men. John 10, 28 is a passage that I would take children and students and even adults to from time to time to help them understand what baptism is all about um, and what God does when he saves us. 
And, and this is the true pr uh, principle and illustration for this, but um, we're going to be, my family and I are leaving for the beach after church, and you're like, cool, vacation. Well, kind of, but we'll be back on Tuesday. Um, we're going down for Suzanne's brother, who's getting married tomorrow, and we're doing the wedding, I'm doing the wedding, and we're going to support. And so, quick beach trip, down and back, um, to do a, a marriage. Here's the cool thing about the wedding ring, okay? So, many of you don't wear wedding rings because it's gotten lost. It was lost 20 years ago, or you're a farmer, and it, like you don't want to lose your finger. You'd rather go ahead and lose the ring than lose the finger, right? So, you don't wear it anymore. And so, I would get the kids, and I'm like, here's two things that John 10, 28 teaches us. And here's what baptism is all about. Um, I can be married whether I have the ring or not, but when Suzanne and I got married, she didn't give me this ring. This one's one of those uh, silicone or whatever rings because my circle turned into an oval. Um, so we're like, it's time for a new ring. I can't put it on anymore. But I would ask a kid, what does this ring mean? And they would say, well, it means you're married. Okay, well, good, if it's on a certain finger, right? And usually if it's gold in a complete circle. But let me ask you a question. Am I still married now? And they would be like, well, yeah, of course you're married. I'm like, married now? Yeah, married now. Yeah, so what is the ring? The ring just tells people you're married. Okay, great point, right? Baptism identifies my life with Christ, and it says to the world, to church, to tithes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm identifying with the life and the death and the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. But also that if, if, uh, illustration says this, and so when I give my life to Christ, I'm placed in the palm of God's hand. And John 10, 28 says that nothing will ever snatch me or grasp me from the life, from the hand of God. Like I'm eternally forever secure in his grasp. I didn't, I didn't save myself. I can't unsave myself. I didn't do anything for my salvation. And now he's got me in the palm of his hand. So therefore, verse 28 I shouldn't be frightened by anything this world can bring to me. Why? Because I'm in God's hands. I love what Psalm 118.6 says. And it says, the Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. And then this awesome question, what can man do to me? Like David would go on to say, the worst they can do is kill me. Paul would say, but to live is Christ and to die is gain. So really, when you kill a, a, a believer... You've kind of helped them out a little bit. You've ushered them into the presence of God. You've gotten them home. What can man do to me? I've, I've been insecure in all my life and dealt with insecurity on, on the way I look and the way I talk and all this stuff. And insecurity has just always been an issue for me. And one of the greatest verses has been this verse and helping me get past that and the, and the stinging comments of people and just the, like the ribbing of guys and different things or the comments and anything that's negative though it's tongue-in-cheek those, those really cut down to the bone of who I am because I deal with the insecurity things people don't know that and I'm not gonna well I've, I'm not gonna broadcast that even though I've broadcast that but but I, and I don't want to keep people from from you know being real with me and having fun with me and and I say bring it on because now you know as long as you're okay with scripture right People start cutting too deep, and I just start quoting Scripture at them, and then they're like, well, God, I was just joking. You didn't have to bring God into this. And I'm like, always, baby. I mean, it's whenever, right? Always, manner of life. The Lord's on my side. I won't be afraid because you can't hurt me. What can man do to me? Nothing. Like, even, even in your best attempt to destroy me, you don't hold that right. You don't hold that authority. You can't touch me. Now, I don't think I say that, and you're like, well, gosh, we're not out to get you. I know, I'm just saying to the world. I wasn't saying this to you, Tyus. But Paul says the very fact that people oppose you points to their destruction. You know why they're opposing you? Because they're not of you. Because if they were of you, they would join you in the promotion versus the slander of the gospel. This is not home. Don't expect to be treated like this is your home. Remember the words of Jesus. He said, the world will hate you. The world will oppose you. It's comforting, right? Come join the family of God where everybody hates you, <laughs> where the world is going to oppose you. But no, God calls us and he equips us to glorify him whenever I go and whatever I do. This is my life. So I want us to think back just as we close to the whole series. And as we think back to all that we are in Christ, God has created us to live a life for his glory. Here's the truth of the gospel, and I'd love for you just to pay attention with all you got. 
He's created you to live a life for His glory. Sin messes that up. Sin makes that life impossible. But we're not left without hope. God, through Christ, has made a relationship, has made a way possible for you to live that life. And it's in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Once we come to Christ, we seek to live a life, everything that I have, my manner of life, be worthy of the gospel. Paul would say to the Galatians that our life is hidden now with Christ, Galatians 2.20. And so 2.21 says, I don't want to set aside. I don't want to nullify. I don't want to cancel out the grace of God to my life. So then my life is to be lived for Christ. C.T. Studd says this, and it's on my um, office wall in a painting. It says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But the things of this world don't stop calling or making it hard to live this life. So we constantly fight sin. We constantly seek the things of God. Keeping our hearts and our eyes focused on Him. And, and here's, a, here's another cutting statement. It's time we stop giving God left, leftovers. All right? Start making Him and His things the priority in your life. With your family time, your personal time, your screen time. All of you. So it's time the things of God become the reason we miss the things of the world. And so many times it's opposite. So many times the things of this world become the reasons why we can't do the things of God. And I'm not just talking about church on Sunday. I'm talking about our lives. So many times in my life, the things of God have taken a back seat to the things of this world. So it's time the things of God become the reason we miss the things of this world. Too often it's the other way around. And I feel that, that tension too, because that's a reality of where we're at in life, because we're so, so busy. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we bring this to a point of, of invitation? An invitation is a, simply that. We're inviting you to respond to that which you've heard. The Word of God is always communicated and proclaimed for the purpose of a response. God always has a purpose for writing and sharing. And so each time we open the Word, we dive into it, a response is, is required, is needed. Whether we reject the truth that we've heard or we attempt to apply it. And so this morning, just to maybe help guide your response, now, I want you to think about your own salvation. Has there been a time in your life that you've followed Christ? Because the truth is, only Christ can make it possible for our lives to be lived for God's glory. So, do you belong to Him? Are you following Him? I mentioned baptism this morning. Has there been a time in your life that, yes, you followed Christ, you've become a Christian, but you've never really publicly demonstrated that and communicated that through following the Lord's example of baptism. We've got a baptism. We would love to assist you in that way. So this morning, your response may be, Chris, I, I, need, to, I need to be baptized. Or, Chris, I, I need to be saved this morning. Are you interested in, in a church community, a fellowship of believers who love the Lord and love each other? Are you looking for a place to simply belong that looks like that? Well, our heart at Tyus is to become that place and to be that place and to strive to be that place. Standing firm, striving side by side for the sake of the gospel. Most of you here this morning, you know, the challenge is really simple. Are you giving God all of you or are you holding back? Have you surrendered all or are there still pockets that you think belong to you? That you do have this weekend mentality to the Christian life. What's keeping you from giving Him everything? From giving God a blank check? What's keeping you from giving Him all of you? Whatever your next step with Jesus is this morning, we at Tyus want to help you. We want to strive side by side with you. We want to stand firm, link arms with you, this community, fellowship of, of believers. And Father, we pray that you're glorified through our responding and as we leave that we leave going with your name with your banner lifted high for all to see that we know that we are who we are because of you 
We are what we are because of you. Our forever change is because of you. And we are to be your representative everywhere we go, whenever we go. So Father, help us to live that life, a life that's lived in a manner worthy of your gospel this morning. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Thank you.